The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit WOGCC.com. Thank you. It really is enjoyable to be here with you. And uh, I thought I would start with a story about an elderly couple. And um, they went to the doctor for their annual checkup. And uh, they were there, and he said, you guys are really in good health, but your memories are starting to slip a little bit, so you might want to get you a little notebook that you can carry with you to keep notes uh, about things you need to remember. And so they stopped off on the way home and got them some notebooks, and they were uh, got home, were sitting in the front room, and uh, uh, the guy got up like he's going to go to the kitchen. His wife said, you go in the kitchen. He said, yeah. She said, would you mind getting me something? And he said, no, what do you want? She said, would you get me a bowl of ice cream? He says, sure, yeah, I'll get you a bowl of ice cream. She said, you want to write it down so you don't forget? He said, no, no. He says, I, I got it, a bowl of ice cream. She said, oh, would you add one more thing to it? I said, yes, what's that? Uh, strawberries. Would you put strawberries on it? He said, yeah, okay. She said, you want to write it down so you don't forget it? No, no, I got it. Ice cream, strawberries. She said, uh, oh, one more thing. He said, yeah, what's that? He said, would you put some whipped cream on it? And he says, okay, you got it. She said, better write it down or you'll forget it. And he says, no, no, I got it. Ice cream, strawberries, whipped cream. So he goes out in the kitchen and he horses around with it for a little while. And he comes back in and brings her a plate of bacon and eggs. And she says, I told you you should have written it down. You forgot my toast. Now, that doesn't apply to me because I'm only 60 with 82 years of experience. (laughs) And there are two things I will never forget. And one of them is my salvation through Jesus Christ. And why do I say the Christ? Because Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. It's from the word Christos in the Greek, which means Mashiach or Messiah. And so I want to honor him by talking about his title when I talk about him. And the second thing I'll never forget is is proof of how much God loves me by letting me meet and marry my wife, Nancy. And so I want to thank her for being my most valued gift from God outside of my salvation. Now, I'm speaking this morning on love and war. Yeah, that's it. Um. And I'll be referring heavily on my notes. Now, I start with a funny story because from this point on, it's going to get really heavy. Heavy because I'm going to present, especially to the men, the spiritual leaders, a challenge. The challenge is to become a living example of God's gospel. That gospel involves the deepest commitment a man can make to become nothing short of a walking, talking, literal living illustration of the Christ, especially to his wife. And his wife gets to qualify whether or not that's the case. Because I could say, don't tell me I'm not like Christ with my Christ-like look. (laughs) And so she has to qualify that if that's the case, that I'm illustrating Christ to her. I need to also mention I'm going to be giving you a drink from a four-inch hose, meaning it's going to be more than can possibly be absorbed in one setting. And still I'm hoping it'll create a hunger for more and entice you to review it since it'll be available later. Then as you apply it, you too can master life and experience a glorious, glorious marriage. Here's what I mean. Every Tuesday morning, Nancy and I would fly from Phoenix, Arizona to uh, Ontario, California, and, and then back on Wednesday morning because we had some classes there. We had started in our institute and we're teaching them and discipling those men over there about Christ's likeness. So when you travel that much, you achieve what's called an elite status. And so regularly they bumped us up to first class and we endured that. And one morning way back on our way back to Arizona, we found ourselves in the first class front row 
sitting directly across from a couple of female cabinet attendants. And so Nancy was looking through the Sky Mall magazine. And as she's looking at it, she says, oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? And I looked at it. It was. It's very nice, very expensive. And I said, uh, yeah, uh, let's get one. In fact, while we're at it, let's get one for each of the kids. I got three daughters. Let's get one for each of the kids. Now, I'm looking at the magazine with her. And it's like, oh, that's not bad there either. Let's get some of those. And oh, oh, look at these. Yeah, let's get some of those too. And so we're about ready to buy half the book. And we're having a good time laughing and joking back and forth with each other. And one of the female cabinet attendants says, excuse me. And I looked up. And she says, how long have you guys been married? And at that time, it was 37 years. We're in our 60th year now. But at that time, it was 37. And I said, uh, 37 years. And she said, that's, that's really neat. You guys act like newlyweds. I said, well, thank you. She said, to what do you attribute that? And I looked at Nancy, and Nancy went like this, and she said, what, what does that mean? And Nancy, and you can't buy this, gentleman. She said, he is committed to illustrating Christ to me for the rest of our lives. And they were surprised. By it. Both of them turned out to be Christian women, never had heard anything like that in their life. And so I sold two sets of books, too. <laughs> but um, what I'm looking at is that um, whenever you do that, uh, you, you, when you fly that often, you get that status. And so uh, let's, let's look at the idea of this idea of love and war. Did you know there's a war being waged successfully against Christian marriages? The statistics I've seen show that the divorce rate among Christians has passed non-Christians. We are at 53%. They are at 51%. That wars are being waged between contentious adversaries. Satan and Christian marriages would be an example of that. But we also need to acknowledge that couples who verbally snipe at each other, use critical, abusive words, ongoing bickering, unresolved arguments, day after day conflicts because of bitter attitudes, nonverbal rejection, the silent treatment, and unlovingly tolerating one another are all proof that there are adversarial attitudes in that marriage. And even though some won't admit those are indeed fights, saying, oh, we don't fight. It doesn't mean they're not fighting or wars aren't taking place just because they say that. What's sad is if we won't be honest or admit that they are fights or admit that we do have a problem, how do fights or problems get solved if we don't acknowledge it? They will not be. So is this another problem area that causes adversarial contentions? Women believe they are absolutely convinced that we men know exactly what we're doing that negatively affects them. And that we know exactly the kind of negative effects we are having on them. And that that's our goal. Yet after discipling thousands of couples, and because of my own experience too, I'm here to confirm this fact. We men do not naturally or inherently have a clue about what you're talking about. Why do you suppose all of us men question, what are you talking about? Is this another problem that needs an answer? If you ask any man anywhere in the world, do you understand the heart, the spirit, the mind of a woman? What's the answer going to be? You know what it's going to be. It's going to be no. I stayed in our discovery seminar, and I don't say this to be funny, ladies. Ladies, you have no idea. You do not have a clue about the depths of the ignorance you're dealing with when it comes to relationally or emotionally understanding women. And I don't say it to be funny, but see, we don't know that either because it's not being made public or even in the Christian community thoroughly examined. If that's true, and it is, 
why aren't Christian men being trained to successfully understand women as the Christ would? And as a result, Christ-like spiritual leadership will reside in Christian marriages. Why aren't Christian men being taught to precisely understand their own heart, their own human spirit, along with how to care for and bring it to maturity? And with that understanding, enabling them to care for their wife's heart, her human spirit also. If men aren't being discipled to live with their wife in an understanding way, like 1 Peter 3, 7 commands us to do, then how will a man fulfill the requirements that God outlined for him in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27? Let me give you an idea what I'm talking about. Ephesians 5, 25, 27 says, Husbands, live with your wife. Oh, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way. And learn how to lay down your life for your wife like Christ did for the church. We got a comparison going here? Yeah. Christ and the church, husband and wife. If this husband will learn how to lay down his life for his wife, and see, I've always heard that. Will I take a bullet for my wife? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I take a bullet for my wife. And how many people do you know who had to take a bullet for their wife? None. No, the chances are slim, so am I safe saying, yeah, I'll take a bullet for my wife. Yeah, I'm safe. But at any rate, if I learn how to lay down my life for my wife, like Christ is for the church, I have the power to present her holy, blameless, without spot or wrinkle, glorious. So let's say you have a wife here who's hollering, screaming, and cussing at her wife. Is that holy? No. So where do I go for the solution? Some people say to God, no. To Jesus, no. To the Holy Spirit, no. To the Word of God, good start. But where do I go? To Him. He's got the power. God's given the power to present her holy, blameless, without spot or wrinkle, glorious. So if she's hollering and screaming and cussing at him, why is she just evidence he's not like Christ about something? So why is she doing that? Because she's trying to get his attention. Would she have to do that with Jesus? No. Jesus would pay attention to her and not only pay attention, but know why she's saying what she's saying, what it means, and how to care for her to bring wholesomeness to her. So if she's doing that, it means he's failing to treat her as Jesus would by listening attentively, understanding her emotions, what they mean, what they represent, what the words mean, why she's using those words, and care for her to the degree she doesn't need to holler, scream, or cuss at him anymore because he's listening. He's paying attention. He understands her. And so... Uh, incidentally, <clears throat> excuse me, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 that I just explained are, is exclusively written to men. It does not apply to women. Now, then too comes 1 Peter 3, 7, live with your wife who gets to decide in an understanding way. Live with your wife in an understanding way. And she gets to decide whether or not she feels understood. Say, I do understand you. And she says, why don't I feel like you understand me? Never mind, I do understand you. Just accept my word. This is my Christ-like accepting you look. And so um, here's another area where wars take place daily. When I ask a man who more naturally, normally, actively is emotionally functional in your marriage, you or your wife, and he says, my wife, and he thinks he's just indicted her. And say, okay, uh, roughly what percentage would she say, you say that she's more emotionally functional than you are? Oh, 100%. People usually say, guys usually say between 90 and 100%. But when he says 100%, 100%, it's like he's just indicted her again. And I say, okay, um, would she be 100% more emotionally functional than Jesus, the inventor of emotions? And he says, no. Would Jesus be totally emotionally functional? Yeah. Okay. So would there be any emotions had God not invented them? No, there wouldn't. 
would there even have names had he not given them names? No, there wouldn't be. So I continue. If Jesus is 100% emotionally functional, and she's 100% more emotionally functional than you are, have we just discovered an area where you are at least 100% deficient at portraying Christ? And the guy typically says, well, I never thought of it like that before. I say, that's why we're in trouble. And so if Jesus is 100% emotionally functional, doesn't that prove that emotions are not a girly thing? I mean, look what he went through willingly. The beatings, the bloody mess they turned him into. And he agreed to it and went through on his own. That's not a girly thing. With that in mind, how many marital fights are the outcome of emotionally charged conversations? Then, too, would Jesus know how to respond to any emotionally charged conversation and bring it to a place of resolution? And does, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, doesn't God require that husband become a living example of the Christ to his wife? Of course he does. Still, there are going to be some bad attitudes and wars taking place in Christian marriages daily, and Satan loves it. His goal is to defeat the testimony of the Christ in every Christian marriage throughout the world. That's his goal. Consider why Satan is so successful. He's had thousands of years of experience and millions of people to practice on. And this is our first time through. He's got it all over us. He's so skilled. And he says he's deceitful and desperately wicked. What's the nature of deceit? To keep me finding out the truth. And yet, if you ask any Christian anywhere in the world, do you understand the mind of woman? He, without conviction, will say, no. And I've asked guys to do that, and one guy did. He started asking everybody he met, you understand the mind of woman? And they all said no. And one day he asked his pastor, do you understand the mind of woman? And he said, why do you ask? He said, I'm just trying to find out. Do you understand the mind of woman? He says, no. So um, now that we've exposed what wars are, and that we Christians can be at war, in our marriages, it's time to check out what God's perspective is on war. So let's look at the idea of, uh, in Hebrew, not only in Hebrew, but in ancient Hebrew, because ancient Hebrew involves pictographs. Now, when I talk about ancient Hebrew, I've got to give credit to a guy named Frank Seekins, who lives in Arizona also, and uh, I've talked to him often, but not, not he's what I consider to be the world's foremost authority on ancient Hebrew. But now I'm just a student. I'm just learning about this. But anyhow, first, our first slide is about the idea of war. And the word war in Hebrew is lachem. But what's interesting is that's the word for war, lachem. But do you recognize the word beth lachem? Lachem is also the word for bread. Bethlehem, the house of bread. But what's the similarities? Well, when you make bread, don't you need to beat it up pretty bad to get it ready? And don't you want to rise to the occasion? And, and that's what you beat it up for? Does it sound like boot camp so far? And then you take it, at, when you get it risen up to the right height, you stick it in the oven where the heat is in the war until it turns out victorious. It's a loaf of bread. And so it's similar to war and that they use that uh, similarity. But anyhow, <clears throat> so we have the word lehem. The first letter in that is the letter lamed, and the next one is chet, and the next one is mim. Okay, but those are modern Hebrew, and the modern Hebrew's translation is war. But I want to find out what God meant when he used that word. And I can find out precisely what he meant by going to ancient Hebrew, which are pictographs. And so when I do that, my first letter is lechem. That's a shepherd's staff. 
and it's for authority or guided towards. The next word that we're going to look at is the word uh, chet, and it is a fence. And a fence represents that which is enclosed or confined. And the next letter is the word mem, or the letter mem, which is also a word, and it represents water or chaos, like an ocean. And so the next thing I want to look at is the idea that in this instance, the word, the letter het happens to be the heart of this word. So basically, what the word lechem means is the authority that controls and directs the heart with chaos. That's what God meant when he used the word war. The authority that controls and directs the heart with chaos. I wonder who that authority might be. So that's where unresolved tension and chaos is in a marriage. Who's the authority behind it? And we know who that would be is Satan. Speaking of tensions and chaos, I'm discipling a husband whose marriage has been and is in serious trouble for years. He and his wife are on Skype with me and tells me that he's getting ready to, tra he's get he's getting ready to travel to another state because his mother is going to have hip surgery. So he's going there to be with her. But he really is dreading the thought of being there with her. He tells me why. Because she's so angry. She's so hostile. She's critical. She's bitter. She's mean-mouthed, to name a few. Notice all the emotional words there? So he asked my advice. What do I do about her? And I advised him to be a caring listener and purpose to focus on her emotions. And his wife starts laughing, saying, he sure has a need to learn that. Why'd she say that? Because he's discovered his emotional deficiency. I've been teaching him the value that God places on all emotions, both his and his wife's. So speaking of emotionally charged conversation, women are usually accused of starting them with her emotionally charged words. Why does she have to use emotionally charged words? But at any rate, the idea, she's got all these emotionally charged words. So what, what? God, the inventor of emotions, made a mistake by giving women too many emotions? God doesn't make mistakes. So could I get you to remember that Scripture tells us that all things happen for the good, except women's emotions? No. So back to the husband. He arrives the day before surgery. His mother's angrily complaining. It's going to go wrong. This, why is this happening to me? Why now? I don't know why I'm even talking with you all. You never cared. Nobody cares. All, all of my kids are ungrateful brats. None of you have ever cared. I could drop dead as far as is any of you are concerned. And she continues on with her tirade. Notice all the emotional words again? That's why, before he left, I coached him to say, this is what I told him to say. And a lot of times I get guys to write it down so that they'll repeat it because I'm trying to teach them how to speak a different kind of language. So he said, oh, Mom, I can see this is really troubling you. It's causing you great grief, and it's starting to you, making you feel all alone and uncared for. I'm so sorry this is so emotionally overwhelming for you. I want you to know that I'm here for you, to comfort and support you, because that's what Jesus wants me to do for you. She turned and looked at him and melted. And they began hugging each other. Her entire disposition changed instantly. He didn't know. We don't know. We have that kind of power as the spiritual leaders in our home. All of his brothers and sisters were watching and were amazed at the instant transformation and later thanked him. 
When he started all that uh, to me, I said, next, you're probably going to try and tell me that God's ways work. And they do. Because initially he was spiritually blind, like the rest of us guys can be, when it comes to understanding the human spirit, its emotions, and caring for it. He didn't know how much spiritual power God had given him and the rest of us guys to conquer his flesh's judgmental negative attitudes towards his mother. Talk about being blind. I remember a time when Nancy asked me, are you mad? I'm like, no, I'm not mad. And she says, why do you seem mad? I don't know why I seem mad, but I'm not mad. She says, you sure seem mad to me. I'm not mad, but you can get me there if you keep on. And I think I'm not mad. And so she's like, how can you not know? No problem at all. I can be spiritually dysfunctional and not be aware of my emotions. I was blind to my sin nature and its control over my anger. How do I even stand a chance of destroying the authority that controls and directs the heart with chaos if I don't even recognize or understand my unchristlike emotions? How do I recognize it when my eyes look this way? They don't look this way. But the answer to this problem is recorded back in Genesis 2.18. When God said, I will make for you a helper. Now, uh, the problem is, we need to look at the word helper. And typically when you ask somebody, what does this word helper mean to you? And it's like, well, child rearing, housekeeping, laundry, dishes, and maybe even grab the other end of that too before they're for me, will you? And we think that's what this helper is all about. But that's what we think. I want to find out what God thinks. Because if I go back to the original time, were there any houses? Nope, there goes housekeeping. Were there any children yet? Nope, there goes child rearing. Were there any, uh, any laundry? No, they were naked. Were there any dishes? These were my dishes. I took care of my own dishes. There weren't even two before then either. So that's all out of the question. But I want to find out what God meant when he used the word helper. And so let's look at the word helper in ancient Hebrew. And that would be, first of all, the idea of the word helper in Hebrew is ezer. And it has three letters to it. And that would be the ayin and the zayin, and the resh. Now, if I'm going to find out what God means by this, I can go to ancient Hebrew and find out specifically what he meant when he gave that name to her. And so what I've got to do first is I have to discover what's my root word in this particular word. And that would be the zayin and the resh. So let's look at the zayin in ancient Hebrew. And that is a picture of an axe. And I always have to say, since we're describing women, let's not jump to conclusions here. <laughs> and my le next letter is the letter for man. And so uh, I have this word, those two letters together are czar. And the word czar in Hebrew is enemy. And so, for example, in, Hebrew, in uh, Arizona, we have a drug czar. They don't even know they're speaking Hebrew, but they are. That's a drug enemy. And so this is the first word, czar, is the word enemy. But we have another letter yet, and that letter is ayin. And the letter ayin looks like an eye. And with an eye you see, but what you see is revealed. And so that letter means revealer. And the R slipped on that. It's supposed to be up in the back of the E. So God didn't say, I'll make for you a helper. He said, I will make for you a revealer of your enemy. What is my enemy? It is sin. Why is sin my enemy? Because God cannot fellowship with sin. And so that being the case, uh, what I need to recognize is that God said, I'm going to give you 
Kenner, a revealer of your sin, your wife will be the one I will use to show you where you're not like Christ. And all the guys said, hallelujah. Why? Because she's going to show me my sin nature. Oh boy, I can't hardly wait. And why don't we like that? Because our sin nature has been running our show. And so my sin nature is not going to say, oh, goody, goody, I get to die while he becomes more like Christ. No, my sin nature says, no, you're not going to become Christ-like. You think you're going to become Christ-like? I'll show you what messing with you is, buddy. Because our sin nature has every intention of keeping us under its influence. So, for example, do I understand the degree of sin in my life? Not really. For example, if I'm reading something and Nancy calls my name, I'm like, what? Do I recognize what that is? Is that sin? Yeah. Why? Because it's saying you're a nuisance. I'm impatient with you. Why are you bugging me? Stop bugging me. Would Jesus say that? No. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And so she says to me, what was that supposed to be? And I'm like, what was what supposed to be? The way you just talked to me. All I did was say, what? <laughs> Why are you picking on me? And so my sin nature took over and convinced me that all I said, the attitude was okay, and that all I said was, what? Yeah. It took over and did that for me. And so do I need help? She says, made me feel rejected, unimportant, uh, like I'm a bother to you, etc. And I can say, well, that's your problem, lady. Or I can say, ooh, Jesus wouldn't have done that to you, would he? But I did. Therefore, I'm wrong. Could you forgive me for making you feel rejected, unimportant, neglected, like you're a nuisance to me? Jesus wouldn't have done that to you, but I did, which makes me wrong. Could you forgive me? And she says, of course. Now, we're looking at this idea that now, um, Scripture says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and is blessed to the Lord. The focus on that is not thing. The focus on that is blessed by the Lord. He blessed me with this woman in my life who's helping me discover where I'm not like Christ so I can become like Christ. And so it says, here's the blessing in that. See, now I have a pair of eyes that look this way to help me see my sin nature. And my eyes that look this way are named Nancy. What's the name of your eyes that can look this way, guys? And so to help you discover your sin nature, which every Christian should welcome if his goal is Christ's likeness. Because I so seriously needed it, that's the nature of the personalized help God provided me with. Nancy accurately helped me identify and detect my sin nature. How can I become a living example of the Christ if I won't even accept the scrutiny that exposes my sin nature? So I can discipline myself about putting it to death and in that process become more and more like Christ. Now, let me mention, when you put your sin nature to death, it's like a zombie. It gets back up and comes after you again. You have to keep putting it to death daily. Remember, we have to take up our cross daily. And the cross is not a sign of a picnic. Now, by submitting to God's plan, to reveal my sin nature and put it to death, I found spiritual strength I didn't even know existed. That strength has allowed the Holy Spirit to exercise more influence over my human spirit than the influence my sin nature has had. My spirit's becoming more mature. I have more spiritual power to draw upon for mastering life. Additionally, as a spiritual leader, I'm able to lead my whole family to victory 
and accomplished peace. For example, uh, by working on me, my older, I have three daughters. My oldest daughter watched me work on me. And she said to me when she got married, would you disciple my husband, Tim? And I said, me? And she said, yeah, I've been watching you as a husband. They do that, you know. I've been watching you as a husband, and I want you, uh, I want to ask you if you would disciple my husband. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And he was willing, because he was watching us too. And so I discipled him for several years, and it, it, this is not a quick fix. Remember the master teacher himself spent three years with the disciples and told a parable, and their basic response was, huh? And so he, what am I going to do with these guys? Oh, I know. I'll send the Holy Spirit back to continue the work. So becoming like Christ, just have, I got good news for you guys. It's a lifetime effort. It never ends. And so I got to disciple my son-in-law, and then he had children. And his children watched me disciple him. And so one of my granddaughters said to me when she was going with this guy, would you disciple him? I'm like, yeah. So I got to disciple him for a year before he got, they got married and I got to perform the ceremony. And so now I have a great grandson. I got three of them, as a matter of fact. But at any rate, can't wait to get a chance to disciple him. That's going to be, be the fourth generation. And so I'm looking at that as an idea about bringing peace and accomplish victory in our lives. That's what I want for every Christian. And I've told guys, uh, all I'm going to disciple you for is Christ-likeness. And I do not apologize. I cannot accept anything less for you or me. Sorry, I can't. Now, since we're talking about peace, let's look at the word peace to see what God had to say there, too, okay? And so, the word for peace is shalom, and um, it has uh, several letters to it. Uh, the first one is sheen, and the next one is lamed, and then vav, and mem. But again, that's Hebrew, that's modern Hebrew, and the word for modern Hebrew is simply Shalom or peace. But see, I want to find out what God meant when he used that word. And I can do that again by getting into ancient Hebrew. So the first letter under Shin, Shin is the, it's not a W. That's not a W. That's a word for the fangs of an animal that's used to rip apart and destroy. And so that's the word for that. Destroy or devour for the letter Shin. The next one is Lamed, and Lamed, again, represents authority and direction. And the next one is Vav, and Vav is a nail. And a nail is used to establish. You build your house, you establish your house. You want to put up a bulletin, you nail it with a, so people can read it. So it's used to establish things. And the last one, again, is Mim, and that's for chaos. Now, what did God mean when he used the word peace or shalom. He meant that with peace, the purpose of peace is to destroy the authority that establishes chaos. You remember who had chaos going on in our life? Satan. And with peace, we can destroy that authority. In fact, we're looking at the idea that with peace and War, we have uh, both in the next slide, Lamem, uh, Lamed and Mem. We also have in the ancient Hebrew, Lamed and Mem. And those are the words for the authority of chaos, authority over chaos. The question is, who has that authority in our lives? And so the question is, again, who has that authority in our lives? Our sin nature or the Spirit of God? That question lets us proceed directly to the word love for a surprising answer. A common question is, what is love? And you'll hear a thousand answers to that question. But the most important question is, 
What's God's definition? So let's look at the word love. And the word love is a hav, and the A-H-A is missing on that. So if you could write that in your notes, A-H-A-V. And it's pronounced ahav. And so the first letter for that is the aleph. And the aleph, uh, and then the next one is hey, and then bet. And so if we're going to define that, uh, incidentally, um, the middle word there, hey, maybe some of you have said to your kids, hey, 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 and they're not paying attention to you, maybe they don't speak Hebrew. <laughs> okay, anyhow, so I, I'm going to take and I'm going to find my root word for this again, and the root word is the aleph and the bet. Now, the aleph, again, is a picture of an ox. Remember, see the ears sticking out the side and the horn sticking up and the nose. And again, the ox is strong in strength. The next letter we need to look at is the bet, because this is our root word. And the bet is a picture of a house or a home. It's a tent on the ground. And so we have here the word, and I'm going to pronounce it, and when I pronounce it, you'll know what I'm saying, okay? That word is Abba. Okay, the word Abba is the word for father. Okay, now the middle letter, we still have a letter going here yet, is the hay. And the hay is a picture of a window. And with a window, you see in or you see out. And what you see in there or outside is revealed to you. And this happens to be the, the heart of this word. And so basically what we're looking at is that the word love means revealing the heart of the Father. That's what God meant by it. And so an example would be uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm not a revelation of the heart of the Father. I am become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I have not love, I'm not a revelation of the heart of the Father. I'm nothing. And if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, I'm not a revelation of the heart of the Father. It profits me nothing. And that definition makes Scripture come to life. And every word you see in there that talks about love, it's talking about being or not being, depending on if it says not loving, being or not being a revelation of the heart of the Father. Now, who gets to decide whether or not I'm revealing the heart of the Father? How about the observer? Okay, so... Uh, of course, that brand of love is not the human brand of love. But we run into a problem here. Because God wants us to be a revelation of the heart of the Father. But Galatians 5.17 tells us God, the Father, is spirit. Galatians 5.20 says that love is the fruit of the spirit. Now, I'm going to give an example of why that's a problem. Here's a guy that comes to me for help. His wife has left me, and he's an emotional basket case. So I ask him, can you describe to me the condition of your spirit right now? And he's like, um, could, could you maybe reword that and I, so, I can get it, so I can answer it? And I said, could I propose to you that the reason I would need to reword it is because you don't know how to respond to it? He said, you don't understand what I mean. He said, yeah, yeah, I, I don't. And I said, okay, so... I ask him, are you feeling grieved? Yeah. Do you feel betrayed? Yeah. Do you feel shocked, angry? And I offer a whole bunch more emotions, all of which he agrees that those are his emotions. And I say, doesn't it seem strange to you that I have to tell you what your emotions are? I have to give you names for your emotions? And he's like, 
Yeah. So I continue, and I say to him, can you show me your right thumb that quick? And I say, when's the last time someone asked you to show your right thumb? He said, never. And I said, and yet instantaneously you responded. That's how well I and God want you to know about your human spirit. Why? Women live here. We live here. And God wants us to learn how to live here. So he's put us someone in our life that lives here so we can learn from them how to do that. And yet, uh, we're looking at a bigger problem here. Since God is spirit, how can man possibly be a revelation of the heart or spirit of the Father, who is spirit, if he doesn't even understand his own human spirit? It isn't going to happen. Now, here's more spiritual confusion. Please remember, love is the fruit of the spirit. Please keep in mind, here's a guy who admits he doesn't understand his own spirit, whose wife left him, and he asks, how can I let my wife know I love her so she'll come back? And I say to him, well, let's check out that word love. And I say to him, have you ever been angry at her? Yeah. He says as if, isn't everybody? And I say to him, okay, have you ever been impatient with her? Pfft, yeah. Again, what's the big deal? Have you ever been unkind to her? Yeah. Okay. But God says love is never angry. Love is always patient. It's never impatient. Love is always kind. It's never unkind. Love never fails. And based on that, can you recognize and agree that you never really have loved her or God? And he says, yeah, yeah. I can see that. He says, wow, I've never thought of it that way. Uh, yeah, I can see. I never loved her. And I said, can you tell her? She wasn't there with us. Can you tell her that God is showing me that I never have loved you? And I need to learn how to love you. And if it's the last thing I do in this world before I die, I am going to learn how to love you. And he said, yeah, I can tell her that. So he calls me back a couple days later. He says, boy, did you get me in trouble? I said, yeah, why is that? He says, because of what I told her. I said, what were the words you used? He said, well, I discovered I never have loved you, and if it kills me, I'm going to have to learn how to love you. <laughs> I said, you think that's the same thing I said? He said, yeah. Ladies? You have no idea. You do not have a clue of the depths of the ignorance you're dealing with. And we live there every day. Again, you ask any woman, any guy anywhere in the world, do you understand my woman? No. And you can show them the scriptures. Says, live with your wife in an understanding way. You say, do you understand women? No. No conviction. Why? Show me somebody that does. And so I've heard some women say, figure it out for yourself. You're a big boy now, and I'm not your teacher. They've also been scolded. You're not the Holy Spirit, which they've never claimed uh, that they effectively were, and it effectively silences them. You're not the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit work on them. The Holy Spirit is supposed to bear witness with my spirit, but my spirit is dysfunctional. Ain't going to happen. It's not that he doesn't want to. It's that I have to become more sensitive to my spirit. What's God's mean for me to do that? My wife. She's very spiritually sensitive. In fact, I say, ladies, you have a relationship with God we don't know about. Why? Because you live here. We live here. And God wants us to learn how to live here, and that's why he made you live here. And so... Uh, they've been scolded. You're not the Holy Spirit. Back off. Then two, when they've tried to speak out about a problem, he either gets silent and withdraws from the relationship or gets angry. 
And when his anger is addressed, he says, it's because you keep pushing my buttons. And so the counsel she receives is, stop pushing his buttons. And I'm saying, um, but wait a minute. Have you ever noticed that every time she pushes his buttons, his sin nature shows up? And it's like, um, instead of getting her to quit pushing the buttons, how about getting rid of the buttons? And if she's a button revealer, I have my very own personal sin button, flesh button, natural uh, sin nature button that she's shown me about, and I can get rid of it. I have my very own flesh revealer in my home. And all the guys are saying, oh boy, hallelujah. <laughs> so there's a need to stop and consider. Again, wow, that means I have my very own flesh, my sin nature revealer. So instead of getting her to stop pushing the buttons, he needs to learn how to get rid of the buttons. So is it possible that God knew we were going to need help? And that's why he designed a wife to function as his helper, revealer of his sin nature. But that introduces another problem. Men and women don't speak the same language. No man naturally speaks womanese. But God commands us to understand our wife. While you cannot find a commandment or requirement like that for women, you can look all you want in the Bible. There is no command for her to understand us. Now, that's one thing we teach men to do, to speak womanese. What women don't seem to realize is this. God designed you to operate from your spirit. He did that so that we men would have a living resource, one whereby we could actually measure whether or not we're becoming spiritually functional enough to have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with you, which is God's way of providing us with a physical resource, giving us a way to practice spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with our wife as a method for restoring our spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God since it was lost at the fall. Then that spiritual maturity will allow us men to destroy the authority that causes conflicts and also become a revelation of the heart, the spirit of the Father to our family and to the world. What's the word that starts with an H that most people give to Christians? Hypocrite. That's the name we get. Why? We tell them that they need to become a Christian and God will take care of all your problems. And they become a Christian and see like their problems multiply. And they're like, you're nuts. Why do I want to become a Christian and have more problems? Because we don't know how to solve them. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Which is God's way of providing us with a physical resource, giving us a way to practice spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with our wife so we can have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God eventually. Becoming a walking, talking, literal, living illustration of the Christ. If you decide to apply these teachings, teachings let me welcome you to life's boot camp designed to strengthen your marriage and train you to be a walking, talking living example of the Christ and master life. I always thought of life as kind of like, I, I may be age, uh, dating myself, but you remember what bumper cars in a carnival are? That's where you're driving down and, and a bumper car hits you over here, now you're going this way, and then somebody hits you over here, now you're going this way, or from the front and you stop, and you just get knocked all over. That's kind of like life. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have enough of a handle on life where you see it coming and you sidestep, hey, you miss me because we can master life. And so um, some have asked me, how did I learn these things? And my answer is, you don't know anybody less qualified than me. I promise you, you don't know anybody less qualified. I grew up in orphanages. I didn't know what family life was. I never interacted with a father. 
and maybe five or ten year, ten times with my mother. And I, but I have a twin brother, no sisters. I never watched a husband or a wife interact with each other. And that makes me a walking, talking proof that God does indeed choose the foolish to confound the wise. Uh, but if God can teach me these truths, and I promise you, I'm no one special. He can teach you too. And next time, next to me, you'd be a cinch. Now, why do I say that? Let me give you an example that I really am ashamed of. I remember one time that uh, Nancy called me up at work. And she said, I had a miscarriage. Would you come and get me and take me to the hospital? And I said, I'm busy, lady. Get a ride. And she did. She got a ride. I didn't even come to visit her that night in the hospital because I was with the guys. And next morning she called me up and she said, um, I, they dismissed me. Would you come and get me? I said, lady, you don't listen very well. You got a ride there. Get a ride home. And she did. And I, 37 years later, was talking with a couple, and they had had, she had had three divorce, uh, uh, abortions because her husband figured if she didn't, it would mess with her career. So she got the abortions. And that reminded me of that event 37 years earlier. Can we resolve the past? Yeah, we can. And so when I saw Nancy, I said to her, we never have resolved that, have we? And she said, no, we haven't. And I'm crying when I'm talking to her about that. And she's crying now in remembrance about it. And I said, I need to ask your forgiveness for that because I never have. That was a horrible thing to do to you. That could make you feel rejected, unimportant, neglected, dishonored, unloved, uncared for, etc. And I was wrong. Jesus would never have done that to you, and I did. And I need to ask your forgiveness. And she forgave me. Now, do we not remember it? No, we remember it. But it's not remembered against me anymore. And I would like to see every Christian man have that kind of victory. Let me assure you this. I don't know what your fondest dreams are for marriage, but I can guarantee you this. They're nothing compared to what God has in store for us. And as long as we yield to his ways, because God is love. And my prayer for every Christian husband and wife is that they experience the absolutely astonishing blessings of having a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with each other and jointly with God. Then, too, will also be a revelation of the heart of the Father to your family and the rest of the Christian community. If they haven't yet discovered how to win the war against their sin nature, you can help them. I pray that your testimony will include becoming a literal, walking, talking illustration of God and his love to us through his son, Jesus, the Christ, as you win the war with love and master life. Thank you for letting me be here with you. I probably am having more fun than you are. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit wogcc.com.